Good afternoon, everyone. Am I too loud? OK. Awesome. Thank you for coming in uh, to the session immediately after lunch. Uh, the room is purposely kept cold so that you don't close off. <laughs> and hopefully, you will prevent me from closing off at the same time. Uh, we are here to hear me rant about one of my favorite uh, topics, which I have been burned by many times. Regression speeds and how do we manage them, how do we take them? Before we get into it, a quick introduction about myself. I'm working currently with Mudworks as a test practice lead and I've been in the testing field for more than 17 years now. Done various different forms of testing, uh, right from black box, white box testing, did some performance testing, did support from which taught me a lot about how important quality is, not necessarily testing, how important quality is in a product. And that was an eye-opener for me that just completely transformed the way I approached testing and the intent why I was doing testing. Anyway, uh, my email ID is my Twitter hashtag is out here. The About Me page has got more information how you can connect with me. Enough about me though. Why are you here? What do you expect from this session? To learn how to right size a regression suite. Okay. Uh, to learn how to right size a regression suite. Yes, we will be covering that. Anyone else? Yeah. To learn more about BDT. To learn more about BDT, of course. Yes, we'll be talking about that. <coughs> so. uh, to give you a little bit about what not to test. Absolutely, very important. What not to test. Coverage in terms of? In the regression. Okay. Awesome. So, uh, coverage in terms of functional, business, functionality, technical, what areas do we want as part of regression? Yes? Is there ever that? Is there anything that we should not include in regression? No, is there ever a time when you should not include? Oh, ever a time when you should not include? Right. Okay, is there ever a time when, when we should bypass regression? Um, interesting, I'm going to just note that down. I'm not sure if I have it covered. I, I asked that question because I have some issues with that. Okay. Some that I feel like it should always be included, but okay. some Okay, so if it doesn't get you know, covered over here, let's please connect after and uh, we can talk more about that. Um, uh, tools, uh, that's another thing that we will speak about very briefly. Uh, I've got about 75 <coughs> slides and I've got 45 minutes to cover that. Uh, so we'll definitely mention tools for five seconds uh, in that. I have a slide for that one. Okay. So by all means, keep asking questions or uh, comments along the way. Please feel free to interrupt. Uh, I usually lose my track of questions if I have to wait later. It depends on you how it works best for you. The slides are going to be available, uh, so not necessary, not necessary to really make frantic notes. Uh, they will be available to you. And also, I have a, a speak with the presenter or whatever they call it, one-on-one -on -one, uh, later. Uh, so if you want to catch up uh, beyond this session also, we have another opportunity on this. If there are certain things that we will not talk about uh, in the planned session, I'll try to make note of that on the parking lot, and uh, we'll try to get to it separately. Let's get into it. Let's think about a case study. And I want every one of you to think about this. Maybe, you know, closing eyes would be a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> Just think about it, no, without closing eyes. Think about a project or a set of projects that you've been working on, which have been really multi-dimensional, uh, they're really long running, involving many, many components or project teams of sort. Think about something that you have been in, or something that you can relate to what you might have experienced others going through. Does this include any form of legacy application interactions also in some form? It would be great if that complexity is also there, if you can think about those scenarios. And, of course, they have to be integrated, otherwise what's the point of having all these different products which don't talk to each other in some way, right? 
Can everyone resonate with some such scenario? Yeah? Great. What are the typical functional testing challenges you face when testing such applications? Yeah. Change in requirements? Apps not being in sync. Apps not being in sync. Sorry? Multiple deployments? People not talking to one another, yeah? Fragility of test cases. <coughs> Integration between applications. Yes, and I'm sure each person can come up with five more different types of challenges that they've gone through. To me, challenges really come out in form of, yes, these are real problems. But what happens with the functional testing? We either have limited or long-running uh, or flaky automation because of these complexities, right? People are talking to each other, deployments, various factors resulting in this. The regression cycle, is it small or long? What is the typical regression cycle in <coughs> these case studies that you've spoken or thought about? Six weeks? Anyone less than that? Two? Two weeks, okay. One week. Anyone beyond six weeks? Eight weeks? Sorry? Eight weeks, okay. You're talking about a successful run regression cycle. That's a separate debate. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just the planned regression cycle. I was working recently uh, on a banking platform uh, program, banking platform replacement program. They've got, I think, a four month regression cycle plan uh, for it. And it's a massive uh, system. It's a uh, huge, huge, weird complexity for various reasons. but. That's reality. That is the reality of the day. So the regression cycle is long. We don't need to speak about huge cost of fixing defects. Almost every uh, speaker you would have heard, and uh, by your own experiences, you know the cost of fixing defects later is huge. Okay. So what happens as a result? The tests that we have they become brittle. They have little or less value in terms of what information they give out. There is no real visibility into what is being tested because you've got such a long regression cycle and you're just executing test cases over test cases to get it done in that compressed time period. Whether it's one week, ask the team, they'll feel it is compressed. Ask the team if six weeks is compressed or not and they'll still say it is compressed. Right? Time is never sufficient. We are always running. So, we don't really know what is being tested. We are trying to just get uh, check boxes done that yes, this is done. We've executed this, pass, fail, that's about it, we fix fine. As a result, these tests become a maintenance nightmare. Because they are maintenance nightmare, they can also become outdated because how many of us have had time to go back and update our test cases or test plans and keep it in sync with the product? Any show of hands? We've got a few. Okay? Is it easy to do? No. You have to struggle to find that time and make that uh, work. Okay. We keep one day in a week to go back and do a manual regression test cases updated. Okay? So that's a separate time taken to keep the test cases updated. Probably a good technique in the context, maybe, maybe not. Right? There's always a context factor to anything that we say. Uh, <coughs> And it's expensive to maintain, build, keep running them time and time again. Whatever happens with these tests. The bigger problem that this results in is the trust deficit of the team or between the team. We are talking about team members not really talking to each other as well. When things do not go well, what happens when the regression is not successful? They don't want to talk. They'll rather they talk behind the back. It's not that they won't talk. Right? It's human nature. It's nothing against, uh, not being judgmental. But that's human nature. I found this defect with the developers just discarded it. It works on their machine. Classic excuse, right? But the trust deficit is huge. As a result, what happens? You start losing value. Automation? Why do we need automation? We have to do this manually anyway. Manual testing? 
too long. Why is the testing team taking so long to run? We delivered this functionality so quickly, the test team is taking six weeks to uh, get it uh, regressed. It's a big problem. And then the finger pointing and the blame game starts. Okay? That said, I just want to quickly relate with you my case study when I spoke about uh, and I asked these questions. I was testing an auction application. It really has just two web pages. One is the admin interface of the setup the auction. The second was the actual auction interface itself. It's a used car auction site and a lot of vehicles are getting sold over there. The same page get renders to different users, different forms based on their permissions, privileges, what they have set up. Test data setup is a problem. We are interacting with mainframes and various other systems. Uh, there's a lot of batch processing that happens. The teams are distributed. At least four time zones we are talking about, the teams are involved. Okay? So this is my case study. Probably not as complex as some of you uh, would have imagined, but good enough to demonstrate the concept. Talking about concepts, let's quickly get into the concepts. Uh, I want to introduce to you, hopefully these are not new concepts, but just talk a little about them. First is the test pyramid. How many of us have heard about the test pyramid? A, a, a decent uh, show of hands. Let's quickly go through what it means. The test pyramid was introduced by Mike Cohn in his book, Succeeding with Agile. And later, uh, Martin Fowler and various others have written and spoken a lot about the test pyramid. What this really means, for ideal test pyramid has got various different types of tests. These are the types of tests that I could fit on which would still be readable to everyone. What really different types of tests represent or are applicable depends on the product under test. If it doesn't have a UI, you don't need the uh, you probably don't need the functional UI based test automation on that, right? Those kinds. So it's very context sensitive. What is applicable to your product under test? What this means is this is automation. We are not saying manual or exploratory testing is not required. There is a cloud or a bubble of manual exploratory testing which sits on top of the automated tests, which combined together give you a sense of quality about what the product is. How is your product? What the pyramid does not indicate, which I've tried to do so here, the, the inverted pyramid represents the product at a test. The unit tests, which are maximum in number, are covering the most granular functionalities of your product code. You write one particular method, you have got probably X number of unit tests corresponding to that piece of code. As you go moving up the no, pyramid, <coughs> the scope of how much product your test is interacting with keeps on increasing. That is what the test pyramid indicates. The other part that it indicates is the number of tests keep on decreasing as you go up the pyramid. What it means, you should have maximum number of unit tests as part of your automation coverage and the least number of the functional UI tests in a complete suite. At the same time, unit tests focus on granular bits of functionality. Functional tests focus on the breadth of functionality. So imagine if these are 10 tests, 10 tests should cover the breadth of functionality, not specific granular UI functionalities. That can be done by the view tests, for example. Right? So this is what the test pyramid indicates. The other aspect is the time effort and cost keeps going up as you traverse the pyramid. The time to execute the test. In case of unit test, it might be milliseconds or seconds. In case of uh, functional test, it might be a good few minutes or tens of minutes for that matter, depending on what scenario you are trying to automate from a functional UI perspective. The effort required to build these, again, changes drastically. It keeps on increasing drastically because as you go up the pyramid, you need to have more and more of your product built and deployed in certain environments to make it available for testing, which means the feedback cycle is going to be longer. You need to have more hardware, software provision, a lot of other pieces need to come in together to make those tests feasible and relevant. Okay? As a result, cost also increases. Okay? 
This is what the test pyramid is. If you break it down further, up to the view test, right, from unit up to view test, these are the technology facing tests. If I want to have integrate with a payment gateway, the technical implementation of that can potentially have various different forms of tests, which are purely in terms of the implementation side of it. However, the web service test, the functional test, the manual exploratory testing, you are focusing more on the business aspect of it. What are you trying to do with that payment gateway interaction? What payment are you processing? What happens in case of failure? That is business decisions, business functionalities. Okay. So this is what the test pyramid indicates. Now, if you take a look at reality, let's do some introspection. I have seen in my experience two patterns. The first pattern is there are two test pyramids in a team. Any idea what that could be? Spot on. There is a development test pyramid and a QA test pyramid. Why would that be? Because uh, I think because of the, the, the abilities of the, the technical abilities of the QA team versus technical abilities of the dev team. But I'm assuming one reason. So like let's say like uh, like devs devs would focus on like the white box testing and maybe QA would focus on black box testing. Uh, maybe not specifically because of technical abilities, but but how is that different from the test automation pyramid? Because we are not talking about tools or technologies in that. So, okay. so what you're saying really is a technology uh, technical capabilities and technology stack differences <coughs> potentially. And it's fine to have that separate. Any other thoughts? Yeah? QA is not leveraging the dev test. So I would expand that more than just leveraging. QA leveraging dev test. There's no collaboration between QA and dev. As a result, what happens is there's a divide between these, though the two pyramids are testing the same or <coughs> thinking they're testing the same product under test, because of lack of collaboration, they're just completely destroyed. It's not about technical uh, stack or whatever. It is just because of lack of communication, what happens is you might end up duplicating a lot of tests, a lot of validations, a lot of intent across these pyramids, or a bigger problem is you miss out on testing certain scenarios, on automating certain scenarios. Duplication is a better problem to have than having gaps in testing. Fair? That's a big problem. That is something that I have seen happen quite a few times. <coughs> the second anti-pattern is what we call the ice cream cone effect. The product under test is still the inverted pyramid, but now the test automation pyramid is also inverted. Can anyone relate with this? Yeah? You've got minimal number of unit tests, you've got a huge set of functional tests. Does that work for you? But what happens as a result? Cost is super high. Yeah. Cost is super high, you lose trust in the automation, and as a result, you need a huge effort on manual regression anyway. And extended triage because now you're trying to figure out if all those in a service problem was a bad yeah. test data problem. Cost of fixing defects, right? It has gone up because you've moved up the chain so much. This is another classic anti pattern which happens a lot and we need to watch out for it. So, the test automation pyramid is a concept which is known to almost everyone, most of us. But do we really understand what it means to implement the test automation pyramid? Are we still working in silos to implement the best of breed technology and tests in our individual silos? But because of lack of collaboration, we just have completely destroyed testing activities. Okay? That is the first thing. What we are going to be focusing on is how do we identify the top layer of these tests, the business facing tests, in an efficient fashion which is going to be valuable to us, which is going to be valuable to the team, and effectively these become our regression test suite. How many of us work in Agile? Or in the Agile? Almost everyone? So we've got uh, iterations or sprints, and the classic example I like to give is if there are 10 stories we are playing in each iteration. Let's say on the average we have got 10 test cases per story. 
So per iteration we've got 100 test cases. If we end up automating everything, then what happens in the next iteration? When we have another 100 stories coming up, and we've directly added 100 story uh, test cases from the earlier iteration. We've got 200 test cases automated. Iteration three, we've got 300. Is this manageable? Is this sustainable? Just by automating it, doesn't mean it is going to add value. You have to understand what is the right set of tests to automate, which are the right 20 tests I can pull in from the earlier iteration, add it in my automation suite to make it valuable along with the next set of 30 tests that I automate from this iteration. That is going to effectively build my regression suite. Next concept, BDD and BDD. How many of us have heard about BDD? Behavior driven development. Okay, how many of us are using behavior driven development tools? Very few, okay. So very quickly I'll explain what BDD is. It is, it was introduced by Dan North I believe in somewhere 2008-2009. A very effective tool for collaboration between different roles on the team to make sure you're doing the right thing for the product, of evolving and building the product. So you look at the product uh, out of the box as an end user perspective. Different roles collaborate what needs to happen to implement functionality by looking at it from out of the box. And they come up with a set of acceptance criteria or specifications to say this is how we need to implement it. This is how we need to build the functionality for that product. Okay? Developers then take these <coughs> specifications and they use the TDD practices, test-driven development practices. They write a failing test. Each specification can lead into n, uh, n number of unit tests for that matter, or different types of tests. But they write the failing test first. They implement the code to make it pass. And this cycle continues, and continuous refactoring keeps on happening in the process of implementing those specifications. That is all that I'm going to talk about BDD. It is a development practice to enable collaboration to understand requirements in a very common language, common lingo, in a business terminology, and implementation is done. But it's a development practice. It can be extended to acceptance test driven development, but it is still a development practice. What behavior driven testing, in my opinion, is you might still have specifications but you're not driving development with it, you're driving the testing efforts of it, to ensuring the quality of it. So what I came up with this is, it's just a way of thinking, a different way of thinking to separate the distinction of what BDD really means from a development practice to how it can be applied from a, to a testing practice. It is a way of thinking, it is still an approach of testing where you're looking at the big picture. Why is the big picture important? Because as testers, we get so close to the problem or so close to the functionality, testing out those hundreds of test cases as thoroughly as possible, as quickly as possible, doing the automation as quickly as possible, we forget why we are doing this. We forget why we are building this product. Why is that story even played? Yes, the story may have a business context and uh, the user scenarios and that, but what is it really leading up to? tend to forget that. It is very important to keep the big picture in mind to understand how the end user is going to be using this functionality or set of functionalities. What is their thought process of interacting with it? If it's a mobile app, how are they going to be using it? Will they be using it with a stylus or with gestures or just typing it out directly? You need to understand what the end user is really trying to do to uh, think if the product is really right. And the last thing is what is the core business value that I'm delivering to the end user? It's not just about can I shop for a particular item? What is the end uh, business objective? That is very important to keep in mind. Third concept, it's about the test specification styles. We spoke about the pyramid, the business facing test, and there are two predominant ways of approaching uh, how you can specify the test. One is the imperative style, the other is a, a declarative style. 
Before we go into an example of this, a quick disclaimer. This is not a session or VDD is not about using a VDD tool. You don't necessarily, though we are talk, going to see an example using given when then scenarios using a VDD format, but this is not about a VDD tool at all. It is a technique, it can be applied in any fashion. Okay? So let's take an example. There's a new airline that is coming in, some awesome airline. It's getting launched. The website development or the app development is in progress. And we are just a few iterations in. The functionality that we are building in this iteration is a guest user can search for certain flight options, see the search results, select something from it, and just provide the contact information and save at that point in time. Very basic functionality. That's all we have built so far. So how would you specify tests in this particular example? In the imperative way, <coughs> You would say, even I am a guest user on the home page and I choose round trip option, select Chicago from origin, select San Francisco from destination, select departure date, blah, 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 select, click on, click on search, see the search results page, at least one option should show up and it continues. In one slide, I have not been able to go through that complete flow. Okay? That is the imperative style. You are talking about very UI specific actions, what the product is doing in order to specify your behavior or specify your intent of the test. The declarative type says, given I'm a guest user, when I search for flight options for a one-way trip for one adult from Chicago to San Francisco, and I select the first flight, and I enter valid contact details for traveler one, then I'm able to save and continue. What this does is, in the declarative form, I'm talking the business language, what I'm doing with that domain, with that functionality. I don't care if I have to select or choose or click. I'm talking about what is the business objective I'm trying to derive out of this. Remember, we are talking about the top layer of the pyramid. Okay? I don't care about the implementation details. I care about what is the business value I'm deriving out of this. Clear so far? Difference between imperative and declarative? Yeah? Yeah? A little bit unclear. With it. So, so imperative is almost like the, uh, like, kind of like, it's like kind of like a step by step, like I'm looking at each piece, each thing in the UI is kind of defined. Mm -hmm. And declarative is kind of like the, like, almost like the use case, kind of. Yes. Okay. Gotcha. Uh, it's on similar lines. Uh, the difference, a bigger difference that comes to me, and as we start practicing, writing, specifying intent in these formats, you'll realize in this, if I read this, the intent of the test is clear. In the earlier case, in imperative, I don't know what the intent is. I'm talking about UI actions. What is important to you? On day zero, when your first home page, blank home page comes up, there won't be any declarative syntax that you can really apply or declarative language you can apply to. You will say I go to the home page, I select something because that's pretty much your only functionality that you have. So more often than not, you start off with imperative and slowly you keep on evolving into a declarative syntax. But again, this is not about imperative or declarative. I just wanted to give you guys a flavor of what are the different styles of writing these tests. And you can read more about uh, imperative and declarative. These are just two links that I have. Contra contradicting links for that matter. One emphasizing how declarative is a better way. The other emphasizing why imperative is a better way. There is no right answer. It has to be applied in the right context. The search term I used over here is imperative versus declarative in VDD. I got a bunch of lists. The first two links are what is shown over here. Okay? That said, let's get back to the case study. We all remember the auction site. Various complex functionalities, same page rendered differently for different users. Now this is a concurrent application, right? There can be one auctioneer, maybe five to ten different sellers, hundreds of buyers bidding on that same vehicle at the same time. <coughs> Only one bid can be processed at a time. So if I bid for 4,000, David can bid for 4,200. He cannot bid for 4,000 again. Whatever the bid increment is, it happens uh, and the next bid will be at that increment level itself. If both requests come in at the first time, one of them is discarded, only one bids. 
So it's a very concurrent uh, real-time application. Each vehicle gets sold in less than 30 seconds. And there's a lot of aggressive bidding that happens. Based on who's winning, uh, who's the seller, who's the buyer, different information is seen on the page uh, based on those permissions. So how do you test an application like this to make sure you have the right intent capture, and at the same time, you're focusing on the right things. So I was at a crossroad, uh, a completely different kind of application I was testing at this point in time. This was about three and a half years ago. And I didn't know what I had to do. All the challenges we spoke about functional testing were very fresh in my mind that oh, I don't want to get into the same pitfalls again. What do I do? I did not want to be so far away from the problem or so far away from testing that I need to go and talk to various different people and dig out reports of various different forms to know what is being tested. I wanted to know exactly what is going on at that moment. So I came up with a brilliant idea. Yeah, that's me. That's my better. <laughs> so I said, I came up with two objectives for myself. If I remove the ambiguity about what is being tested and get, being very far away from the problem, provide the same visibility to everyone on the team, right from stakeholders, business owners, product owners, devs, QAs, PMs, all different roles possible. If I give everyone the same visibility of what is happening on testing, most of my problems will be solved. Because then you start getting into the joint ownership of the quality of the product and not saying QA is a gatekeeper or QA owns it or go talk to someone else to find information. <coughs> so how did we accomplish this? We got all different roles together and we started to collaborate. We came up with the most expensive tool set possible because money was not a barrier for the client. I said, okay, the client is paying, why not? Okay? Let's get the most expensive tools and we went into a big conference room and got our most expensive tool out, which was a whiteboard and a lot of markers, <laughs> and told everyone, okay, let's just sit together and figure out what is it that we are trying to do. What is this product supposed to be doing? We started drawing a lot of diagrams, uh, mind maps or flowcharts, whatever you really call it. These are just tools. But in a sense, we started drawing it out in a pictorial format, what the product is supposed to be doing. Now there was some history to the product earlier and as soon as product owners or BAs or devs they came in, they started talking about the UI actions or specific actions needed to be done to achieve functionality. That was our first cut of the uh, drawing. We said, okay, fine, let's park this on the side, let's get another expensive tool in. And with a clean slate, we said, how do these specific actions or specific components you're talking to relate in terms of the business value that you're deriving out of. Does it matter to the business if I'm clicking or checking a, red, uh, checking a particular element? Or does it matter I'm able to select the particular value based on certain business processing rules? So we took this as a first cut and went a few levels up in abstraction to talk about the business value this is starting to provide. The other thing happened at this point in time, and this was very, um, application specific, we figured out that for auction application, in terms of business functionality, we're mixing it up in terms of what is a business functionality and what are the different personas who are interacting with that business functionality. And then we said, okay, fine, we cannot mix it up because it makes it very confusing. You might lose out on a lot of things. So there were two approaches that we had in mind what could be done. One was identify the business flows based on personas and how personas use those business functionalities. So if I, as an admin or as an auctioneer, what are the different business rules that I can uh, accomplish? What is a business functionality that I can derive out of it? That is one approach. The second thing was, think about the business functionality and how different personas can interact with that at the same time. You're still taking it one slice at a time, right? Business functionality or persona. In case of the auction, what worked for us was, you take a business functionality, if I want to sell a car, what are the different things I need to do? Admin needs to set it up, auctioning needs to start the sale, buyers enter the sale. It made it much more easier for the context of the application to say, let's go with business functionality and how different personas can interact with that. We 
redo the mind map so the image is the same uh, in case of the presentation. But we redo the uh, diagram, keeping that intent in mind. Each of the left side nodes became a specific business functionality we are trying to achieve. And then we drew it based on what different roles can be doing. This essentially is a state diagram of sorts so for those who know state diagrams. Once we mapped it out, each individual path from the leftmost side till the end state. An end state could mean the auction is over, or it could mean that buyer enters and he didn't do anything. He just sat listening. It's a valid state of the auction. So we identify each unique journey for that business functionality end to end, listed it out, and then we did our cost value mapping out. Now cost value mapping has got various different parameters. Values in terms of business value that we derive, the risk that uh, is associated with it, prior history of flakiness of that component, for example, could be another value-based decision that we can take. There are various different parameters that we can apply to determine value. Cost is in terms of how much time will it take to automate, what tool set do you need, is it automatable or not, various such factors. How much time will it take to do that? Once we categorized, we looked at all our such user journeys and started mapping it in the cost value analysis, we said, huh, something that is low cost, high value is my first candidate for automation. <coughs> Is this readable or do we want us to lower the lights? Is it okay? Okay. So the first candidate is high value, low cost, 80-20 rule. What is the maximum I can derive in terms of value in the minimal cost? Let's get that done first. That becomes our first candidate for automation. Remember, we are not yet talking about implementing this in form of automation. Just we are identifying the candidates, prioritizing them of sorts. The second is high value, high cost. Yes, because the value is high, I still want to automate. Third is, yeah, uh, low value, low cost. I've got, I'm a tester, I've got a lot of time on hand. How many of us can relate with that? <laughs> right? So it potentially remains as manual regression. Remember our test pyramid, there is a cloud of manual exploratory testing on top, right? It is important, not everything can be or should be automated be very conscious about saying this doesn't make sense to be automated, let's keep it as manual. And of course the fourth one, which has got low value and high cost, I definitely do not want to automate this, I will keep it as manual regression for sure. <coughs> so we do this cost value mapping, and based on this, for my case study, we came up with a scenario like this. Given auctioneer creates an auction, five vehicles are added to the auction, when auctioneer starts the auction, Sets the starting bid off a particular amount. Buyer one bids, buyer two bids, auctioneer sells the vehicle, buyer two wins the vehicle. What this tells us is who is doing the action, the persona. It becomes very explicit for that business functionality about selling the vehicle, what needs to happen. It tells us exactly what the business functionality is in terms of rules that need to happen one after the other that will be possible in the product. It could be a negative scenario also for that matter, right? If two buyers uh, bid uh, at the same time, only one should bid. It's a negative case, but it can be written down in that in a specific format. And more importantly, it depicts a user flow or a user journey, which fits very well with the top layer of a pyramid, with the minimal number of tests, it's having the widest coverage of the product. Okay? So what next? We've identified the scenarios, we prioritized it, we saw a sample. The biggest step in fixing a problem is knowing what the problem is. In our case, we've taken that biggest step of saying what is the right kind of journeys that we need to identify that are important from a business perspective to be executed on a regular basis. Identification done, next problem is easy to solve, just automate it. Okay. Now, we cannot speak enough about this. Automate tests that are valuable, not because you can or you like to automate. I've been in that situation many a times. I love coding. Give me any test. I want to code. Thanks to that, I've got three open source test tools also for that matter, but separate story. But it's important to identify what is uh, the value behind that automation. Because any line of code that you write is going to add maintenance, 
cost and overhead to the team. Whether it's test code or product code, it is uh, cost associated. Now, given that we've automated it, what happens is, the way I like to do the automation in this form is, I do not split up, in typical test cases, what do you do? When I select this item from the drop down, then this item should be selected. Do a test data setup, do action, and do the verification. In this case, what we are saying is, we are validating business rules. Given a business rule and a combination of another business rule is executed, what is the next business rule that can be done on top of it? We are not talking about user actions anymore. We are talking about business rules, how they come uh, one after the other. Positive, negative edge cases in that format. In implementation of it, I can say auctioneer creates the sale. If I'm automating this, the part of automating creation of the sale and verifying if the sale has been created successfully will be happening implicitly inside this. The assertion will be inside it. Assertions are not exposed externally in this case. What this does is for complex products especially, it keeps the focus on business value. It takes, it reduces the noise of saying that I create a sale, then the sale should be created. What value is that really providing to me? It's adding a lot of noise in my case. Okay? Now, this iteration is over. For the next iteration, there's a change of functionality. I go back to my drawing board and say, wait a minute, there's a new uh, business rule that has been added in form of n number of stories for that matter, right? Not just one story. What is the business rule we are trying to implement? How does that fit into the diagram? And along with it, what are the rules that are not valid anymore? Let me get rid of that. Now the minute I do this, again I create my user journeys out of it, and I say, there was a user journey based on this particular rule. This rule itself doesn't exist, I need to get rid of that test. Consolidation starts happening immediately. We've added a new rule in between uh, earlier existing rules, I need to update my existing rules, my existing user journeys, to incorporate this rule in. I'm not just adding tests for the sake of it. I'm looking at opportunities to see how I can build a good, robust user journey to make sure the rule is validated, the business functionality is validated. That said, it is very easy to get carried away and say, I've got one complex user journey which is going to take care of the whole product. Analysis paralysis, right? Be watchful, be conscious. Where can you break it off? What pieces can you uh, specify separately and leverage that validation, not in terms of linking the test in any fashion, that's a bad thing to do. The test don't remain automatic, uh, atomic. But separating the intent of user journeys in various different forms to keep it manageable and concise. Once I update this diagram, again I do my cost value analysis, see how the new rules affect my user journeys, what needs to be automated or not, and proceed again. I have one question. Yeah. Uh, in your user journeys, your um, let's go back to the slide where you said um, you're validating, okay, that one. Give an auctioneer creates an auction. When the auctioneer creates an auction, you, uh, you have several things happening for that one particular action. Mm -hmm. What if one of the things fails? That means your whole test, everything that you have in here has failed. Okay, uh, great question. Uh, did everyone get the question? Okay, so if something in auction creates, the auction fails, basic step. <coughs> if that fails, nothing else should proceed in the first place. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, this is where now you start categorizing the test, the journeys that you've identified into different suites. It's like saying for a banking application, if I cannot log in, there is no point going to testing any particular banking. I just challenge. picked that as an example, but what if halfway down through, you know, mm -hmm. when auctioneer starts an auction, yeah. you have several things going on in the background for that one start auction Correct. action. Correct. Now, in terms of automation implementation, is that what you're asking? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I've used a technique called soft assertions. Uh, this is a slight segue, I'll take half a minute on this and then we'll uh, take it offline if required. Okay. So I use a technique called soft assertions in implementing the automation for user journeys. What soft assertions mean is if something breaks, 
and it is not critical, I can still proceed. I'm going to tag it as a failure in memory in the test execution cycle, take screenshots, take whatever meaningful information, and still proceed with the execution. When the test completes execution, I might have not just one, but multiple such failures or soft assertion failures that have happened. I'm going to tag the test as failed at that point in time, showing all the list of failures, including the screenshots, in the logs along with it. So the test has failed once, but it has potentially captured five different types of validation failures in that journey. However, if it's a critical failure, which is a hard assert, assert by definition says that if assertion failed, stop the test over there, get to the next test. So if creation of the you know, auction itself fails, there is no point in me proceeding further. If adding of vehicles fails, there is no point in me proceeding further based on this intent. Right? I'll stop the test over there saying this is a hard assert, I cannot proceed, this was the error. So it's an implementation detail, how you handle it. But that is, these are kind of innovations and creativity you will need to have when implementing your tests, especially <coughs> because these are long running tests. They, you cannot keep stopping the test at every small uh, thing that goes wrong, especially if you can proceed, otherwise you will never get to the end of it. Which product has all tests passing at all points in time? Such a project, uh, product doesn't exist, right? Uh, so you have to come up with some uh, such solutions. Does that answer? Yep. Okay. Cool. So at the end of this two-year uh, journey uh, on the auction product testing, where we started off from a very basic uh, understanding of a POC of a product and then taking it live, this is what we had. The project management tool that we used was Mingle. We did not have uh, our test case repository, manual and automated, was Cucumber feature files with appropriate tagging in terms of what the components it is using, what features it is uh, uh, testing in those journeys. Our feature files and scenarios, uh, Cucumber terminology, but we had 33 feature files with 65 scenarios in all. At the end of it, the number of manual tests that we had was zero. I'm saying at the end of it, though this was incremental, as new functionality comes on, we identify tests. We put it in Cucumber, but till it gets automated, it remains manual. Everything else becomes automated. So at the end of it, we had zero manual tests. All our tests were running on Jenkins. In fact, the first test that we wrote using building the framework, we had a login test. We set up Jenkins infrastructure for it and put that login test on CI. What that did is, with a small footprint of a test framework, we got our infrastructure set up pretty well and made it robust. Our Smoke test executed in 15 minutes, regression test executed in 45 minutes. And these were tests running in parallel. These are uh, user journeys executing in uh, parallel on the product. The way these tests got triggered is you trigger, a, when a build is triggered, the unit tests or other when tests do a check-in. Unit tests run. When the build is ready, because it was one environment, you couldn't just deploy automatically to an environment. <coughs> You go to Jenkins, say, okay, fine, I'm ready to deploy. As soon as deploy is done, we've got various different categories of tests which run in a particular sequence to get the quickest validation to the team. If smoke fails, I'm not going to run regression at all. It doesn't make sense running it in those form of things. So, how did this technique ever become successful? It seems just too easy. Yes, a question. So a tech, uh, tech stack was uh, Cucumber in Ruby with uh, Capybara WebDriver. So, who would write the Gherkin and who would, uh, who would write the implementation code behind your test? Okay, so uh, in the interest of time, again, I'm going to give a very short answer right now. In our context, we were highly distributed. So because we were not sitting with the product owners or the BAs, we used to write it and send to them uh, for review. Yes, a QA. The QAs okay. is to write it, send it to the devs, BAs, uh, and uh, the product owners for review. And all our tests were written in a business lingo, and the product owner and BA were very happy to see that kind of thing. They were stressed on bandwidth to write it themselves, but they were very happy to see this, that yes, this is what the end product is, what we are trying to build. And it was very incremental, so it was very good discussion over it. But that's what uh, we went out. So this seems like a very simple technique and you know, no rocket science, but will it work for you? I don't think so. 
Why? Because context is the key. It is so important to apply the context to understand the domain where you are in. Understand the product under test. How are the teams distributed if at all? What are the skill sets and capabilities on the team? Based on that, you would come up with your tech stack which is going to be workable in the long run. You would select, you, know, you would come up with a process that will work for that kind of a team to make it effective and you would choose tools to help you in doing that. You cannot start off with tech stack tools process without understanding any of this. That's why I'm saying, will VDT work for you? Probably not. It's better to start off on the caution instead of saying let's adopt it and then we'll see if it works or not. What this does is, or rather what this does not do, VDT will not work in isolation. What does this mean? Need I explain more? You cannot work, testing cannot be working in isolation anymore. Okay? It has to be embedded and working with the team. Otherwise, it is going to be a big problem. The next thing is, we are identifying the top layer of the test, but to make this kind of regression effective, you have to do a very thorough and detailed manual and exploratory testing of the product as functionality is developed. Without it, again, you are just trying to do one thing without looking at the big picture. This definitely requires you to implement the lower layers of the test pyramid. Otherwise, what you are doing is you've identified only a bunch of test scenarios or user journeys, you're automating only that. What happens to the other important test cases that you have come across with? You have explored, uh, explored it and potentially found defects uh, in that. It needs to be automated somewhere. All we are saying is identify which is the layer in the test pyramid where it needs to be automated to get the quickest feedback to the team as quickly as possible. It is very important, otherwise BDT is not going to work for you. Collaboration is very important. So we spoke about how this helps you, okay? Now, in addition, what happens is, what we did on a case study, the builds and deployments were all automated, Though not deployed automatically, it was just triggered to say, okay, fine, go ahead and do the deployment. We also automated a functional performance suite and a concurrency test suite because this was a concurrent, uh, concurrently used application. We came up with unique solutions where we had on one powerful workstation, we could open up 100 browsers with different users logged in and interacting with the app auction at the same time and still validating for each of the users are they seeing the correct behavior? Are they seeing any duplicated bit messages or those kind of things? So we had to come up with innovative uh, techniques like this. So what is the value this uh, brings us? We can incrementally build user flows. Doesn't to come up with user flows or user journeys, you don't have to wait for the product to be stable and built to identify what are the personas, what are the user flows. You start off small, potentially start off in the imperative style and keep on building and evolving your uh, scenarios to become user journeys. Regression, uh, you are actually regressing your product business value. You are not validating tests, you are validating what the business wants the product to be doing. The tests are always in sync with the product because, because this is running from CI. Anytime the test fails, it's either because your test is not in sync with the product or the product has changed unexpectedly than what the test is expecting you to do. And of course, there's a third category, intermittent failures, but it depends on uh, product to product or environment to environment. But if you follow the right practices, your tests are always in sync with what your product business functionality does. The tests become very effective because now you're not just doing specific actions with no sight of why you're doing it. You're testing for specific value. Can I send a vehicle to the highest bidder? Can I ensure no concurrent, uh, no two buyers are placing the same bid? It's very effective uh, kind of test. At the same time, you remove the ambiguity about what is expected from it. Each and every role understands what is required right from a business stakeholder to a product owner, to BAs, devs, everyone, because you're talking the same language in terms of the domain. I'm not talking about the BDD tool aspect of it, 
but you're talking about the same domain language all across. It becomes easy to understand new functionality with the diagrammatic view about how it fits into the big picture. That makes it very uh, helpful. It becomes a living documentation. I know for enterprise products, there's a separate doc team which is building comprehensive documentation, but it helps in building live documentation in form of executable tests, and it becomes a great onboarding uh, strategy also. Onboarding set of documentation for other people. Any role for that matter. And it helps you make uh, become cool. Okay, last few concepts, so I'm uh, sort of running out of time. So I'm sorry about the colors, it's not very visible, at least to me from here. But you start off with a business idea. Why you want to build a particular product or a product line? Those business ideas are broken down into features, features into epics, epics are broken down into stories, which are then in form of planning and uh, slicing to say what is the incremental value you can derive. They are planned into iterations, and a set of iterations, if not each iteration, goes into releases, which starts validating and providing, uh, making the business idea uh, reality, right? What BDD does is it combines the iterations and releases, the functionality, the business functionality from the iterations or from the releases in form of the BDD scenarios, which if automated, become your executable specifications. Executable specifications are actually validating your business idea to ensure that the loop is closed and you have not gone off in a spiral into some different direction. That, I think, is very, very important to be done. We don't know uh, at the end of the release if this is exactly what was required or not. Last bit is the BDT scenarios, they help in the top layer of the pyramid, whereas the stories, the, all the testing that happens at story level, that goes at the technology facing test. So devs are doing a lot of testing, maybe the QAs are also doing a lot of automation testing, view tests over here, but they are more technology facing side, they are not validating the business idea. Business ideas are from iterations or uh, uh, releases that happen. Okay? So this technique helps you identify the right type of scenarios for uh, regression. The tools, I uh, promise I'll speak five seconds about this. It's a technique which you can use with complex, expensive tools like whiteboards, mind maps, flowcharts. If you're poor located, use flip charts. Any such tool works fine. The essence of this is collaboration. If collaboration is not there, nothing will be possible. Last bit about automation. We've identified the set of tests which are valuable to the business, which are valuable to understand what the product is doing. Now you go ahead and automate those. And you can automate it using any BDD tool, like I showed in the example I used to convert. Or with any new tool or technology that you introduce in your technical stack, you are adding overhead and cost and maintenance to it. If there is no such requirement to use a BDD tool, by all means scrap it. You've identified the scenarios in form of user journeys, Automate it directly in any JUnit test, uh, test in the unit based framework or whatever framework you have, tool you have, based on the intent of business value that you're trying to provide. And that will help you build a good robust suite. Again, disclaimer, it has to be the full pyramid that you're looking at and not just functional UI testing in isolation. With that, I have two minutes remaining. I'm open for questions, and we can also talk uh, separately after this. So, having used uh, BDD for a while, what would you say is biggest limitation? Biggest limitation is getting everyone on board and getting that quality ownership on the team. Getting the devs to and the product owners and the BAs to say that yes, I agree with you as a tester that this test is important, but a dev needs to be automating this. So that becomes the biggest inhibition uh, of biggest uh, blocker of source. Guess for those leaving, please uh, share your feedback. Uh, I really value feedback. Good, bad, ugly, anything is fine. Any other question? Yes? Uh, so with one of your points coming across to me as uh, be more selective in the test and you can give the game some method to make you deploy to determine which test to automate. Um, are we kind of just lengthening the timeline before we end up with a very large potentially unmanageable? Because we are continuing to add, we're just being more selective. 
that timeline is getting longer. But so, eventually that problem will still surface, I think. So I think uh, I'll answer this question in a slightly different way. Okay. The test pyramid, right? Yeah. What is the ideal ratio of tests between each layer? That's the right answer. Depends on the context of the product. If your product really needs to have a lot of functional UI tests, then it is the right thing to be done. What we are saying is, you think consciously about what is the type of test that is required to be automated at the topmost layer. The rest still need to be automated, but can you push it lower down in the pyramid? Right? So it's a view test. If I've got a workflow in terms of UI, the third page in the workflow I cannot get to directly, but the devs can use mocks, whatever, get to the third page, load it up in the, on their dev machines or in the dev environment, do some basic Selenium-based tests or whatever, a JavaScript-based test on that specific third page of the workflow. You're still adding that automation. And that's the problem with the subject then. Exactly. You're bringing it together. That collaboration then brings it together. Okay, and uh, uh, we are out of time, uh, but any other questions I can talk outside of the outside session downstairs where we can talk. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Hope it goes well. Okay. Thank you. For a while or so, so I saw the given. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Thanks. Thank Just want to let you know, um, we have a company. Uh, it's called Tellurium, where we basically do web-based EDT. I'd love if you were able to take a look at it and just get some feedback, something like that. My email's on there. Awesome. Um, and you can also just send me a link or something, and you know, we can get connected. Fantastic. Thank you. That awesome. was awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. It's very good. Do you have time for a quick question? Yeah, sure. Uh, I don't know if there's a next session. Maybe we could just take it outside. Um, okay, yeah. 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 Just give me one minute. Yeah. Set up for the next session. <laughs> oh, yes. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that was a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Can I you a PowerPoint? Did I email you? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I will be posting it on my blog anyway, uh, okay. so by all means. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Just, just one quick thought in terms of another response. Uh -huh. One gentleman. And yep. that is, uh, you should be able to do your behavior uh -huh. in parallel. Right. Yes. So, worst case, if things start to get long, just... Sorry, uh, multiple, I'm listening. Multiple machines. Yeah. And, yeah. As long as they're not dependent flows, you're right. Sorry, so the flows get long? So if the flows get long, then the question is can you break them up into parallel tasks? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So that's another way to yep, yep.